Oh, Tom, you're going to go first on the uh, uh, National School Board thing. Okay. And then Karen, you're going to go? Karen, then, go. Yeah, okay. okay. Two more people entered the room. So you can start now. All right. Yep. Um, can we move that list off the? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Portsmouth School Committee meeting from Tuesday, May 11th. Um, if you please rise and join me in a pledge of allegiance and a moment of silence for troops in harm's way, and the and it's well, it's sort of in the back here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Um, I'd like to note that we had an executive session prior to this meeting. No votes were taken. Uh, can I have a motion to seal the minutes, please? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor, uh, say aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, passed 7 0. Um, for the chairperson's remarks, let the record reflect that everyone is in attendance tonight. Uh, should there be an emergency here at the high school, we'll exit and meet over at the new gym. Um, we do have two items on the um, agenda tonight, uh, member professional development update and the National School Board Association conference report. Um, so we've had uh, a number of our committee members uh, engage in some professional development activities. And I'd like to start with Ms. Karen McDade about the Hassenfeld uh, meeting she went to on the funding formula. Thank you. Um, yes, I went to a workshop um, on the 21st that was about the funding formula. It was led by um, Bryas. And um, it started with um, a presentation by Dr. Ken Wong, who's one of the people who developed the funding form formula originally, who um, described how it works and, and what the components are. And then um, Senator Ryan Pearson, who um, headed up uh, a committee that was formed in the, in the state Senate to look at the funding formula. Uh, that committee was formed in 2019. And he um, went through the list of revisions that that committee proposed. They had just um, finished up their work and uh, submitted those, those revisions when COVID hit and everything kind of went on hold for a while. But right now those revisions are still in committee. And I'm not gonna go down the whole list because 15 different things, but um, a couple of the things that I thought would be of particular importance is that there's an effort to make sure that there's a minimum requirement for the localities to contribute so that you can't have the situation that we've seen to a certain extent, which is as state contributions go up, the town cuts their funding and um, there's no net gain to the education system. So they're working to correct that. A second thing is that um, in the past, the only kids who are um, English language learners who have qualified are those who also qualify for free and reduced lunch. And they're changing that um, to include English language learners who do not qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, and the third thing, which um, was in our um, uh, our legislative update toward the end of, the, of tonight's agenda, is to revise the education costs that are in consideration in considering what the funding formula should be um, to also reflect transportation costs. So there, are, as I said, there are a whole host of other changes that are being proposed. Some most 
out of the 15, 10 were short, relatively short term, five were more long term efforts. Um, I believe that most of them are reflected in Senate uh, Senate bills uh, 350 and 351. Um, and as I said, I think they're in the Education Committee right now. Did you get a sense whether they were thinking they would pass in this session, or is it going to be another I, year for them to look at it? Or it's it's a that's a good question. I really I don't know at this mm -hmm. point. Um, most of the changes, especially the well, I think one of the reasons why it's broken down into several different bills is that there are some changes that are seem anyway from our perspective seem like no brainers, seem like very simple things to adjust. And then other things that are more complicated and require more negotiations. If there's anything on the list that we're going to be looking at later tonight, um, our legislative liaison for the Superintendents Association, that's where I got the list from, and he did indicate that um, he kind of broke the bigger list down for us into what we have to look at tonight. Um, that any anything that's on the list we'll be looking at tonight is is kind of still in play to be passed this session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that report. Um, the second uh, report is regarding the Rhode Island uh, Association of School Committee meeting. Uh, RIAS, they had their annual meeting. And uh, Mr. Ferber, Mr. Vadney, and I think Ms. McDade as well attended that. Uh, and, Mr. Ferber, you want to so, start off on that one? Sure. So uh, the meeting was about racial equity and inclusion. And um, it was pretty interesting, actually. We had four speakers. The first speaker was Keith Stokes, who most people probably mm -hmm. know. And Keith kind of spoke to the um, the start of the uh, African American presence in Rhode Island, which was because of slavery. We were one of the leading slave trading centers in the country at the time. And then basically, the um, he, he presented a, a full a full presentation, but spoke to only portions of it. The presentation I sent the presentation to the members that didn't go to Ryask, and I think it's on the website, the Ryask website, for anybody's interest. It was, it was a pretty interesting presentation. And then we moved to um, a couple of representatives from uh, uh, one was from or is the rather the chief transformation officer at the National School Board Association, and I believe I heard she was the superintendent of Prince George's County at one time. So she had quite a bit uh, to say about uh, handling those issues. And Prince George's County, I believe, she said, was one of the largest school districts in the country, if not the largest. And um, so that was that was pretty informative. And the next speaker was uh, from Rhode Island Foundation where she is um, uh, the woman, Angela uh, Encoma is the executive director for Rhode Island Foundation Equity Leadership. And the key thing about both of these speakers is they made it clear that they were available for, for any uh, help. So, you know, the, 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 the conversation was interesting. And in the course of the conversation it was some Q and A, but it was pretty informative on, on the issues that you'd have to deal with or often have to deal with, with um, racial equity and inclusion. And then the last speaker was uh, Wendy Schiller from Brown University, who most people probably know for seeing her on TV. Um, I thought I enjoy listening to Wendy anyway, or, or her uh, political analysis. I didn't quite see the, the fit into the presentation, but nonetheless, it was pretty interesting. So that's my take. Good session. Mr. Vadney, you want to add anything to that? Or? Well, no, I agree. I think Fred covered it. Okay, Ms. McDade? I agree. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well done. Well done. Um, so the uh, the the final item for professional development here uh, for the school committee was a, a NSBA conference um, that was attended by uh, it's a, it was a virtual conference uh, attended by Dr. Kenworthy, Ms. McDade, and myself, and um, we all kind of split up on different panels, but we had some overlap as well. So um, Dr. Kenworthy, why don't you lead off on your report and then Ms. McDade and I'll finish sure. up. Uh, so again, this is a national conference as Dr. Copeland said, uh, always some, some uh, great sessions and speakers. Uh, it was over a Thursday, Friday and Saturday, April 8th through 10th. Um, I was able to attend uh, the opening session on Thursday and then tried to stay as connected as I could over the next uh, few days. Uh, I followed the racial equity strand or, um, you know, as, as we're trying to do some important work in that area. So I was able to attend a session on uh, dismantling racism in schools. And uh, on the final day uh, on Saturday, there was a, a signature equity uh, speaker 
as well. Uh, so in, in those areas, I think some big takeaways were just that, you know, any district that that's doing this work is, you know, struggling with a lot of the, the same uh, growing pains that we've experienced this year. Uh, it's not easy work to do. Um, so it's just nice to, to kind of, um, you know, hear and see some of that on, on a national level and, uh, you know, look for, um, you know, different best practice ideas. We, we have all on our uh, leadership team, you know, pretty much any, any conference that we go to this year has an equity theme or strand. So we've been following along with that as well. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, a couple of key points that were made is, and, and, and I think we're, we're moving towards addressing these and you're gonna hear a little more uh, uh, later this evening on, uh, you know, looking for a, you know, kind of an expert partner, uh, especially in the beginning stages. So I do have uh, a recommendation that I'm prepared to make for that uh, this evening to, to help our district in this work for next year. And then another key uh, piece that we keep hearing come up is about um, having a policy uh, specific to equity. So we've talked about that on the policy subcommittee and I, you should be seeing that um, you know, uh, within the next few months. Uh, I was also able to attend uh, a session just on, uh, you know, uh, senior exhibitions. So uh, you know, we, we have the senior exhibition requirement here in Portsmouth and, uh, you know, many districts do. Uh, so it's just interesting to see some, some different ideas and um, ways that people approach that. Suggestion for change for our district or? Uh, you know, I, I, I think we're actually doing a lot of the, the things that uh, most people are uh, in, in the area. I, I think, you know, the key in this day and age is trying to make it as career focused as, as possible as we can for, you know, really trying to get students thinking about what they want to do when they leave high school. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Ms. McDade? Um, thanks. So I, I also attended um, a number of race equity presentations. Um, a lot of the, the uh, presentations I went to, I was looking at through a, a policy lens and thinking about how it could potentially affect our policy. And um, uh, a number of people who were talking about racial equity were talking about doing, you know, doing an analysis of policies to make sure that um, some segments of the population aren't being unfairly uh, affected by those policies. And so that was something that um, I came away with a lot of enthusiasm for. Um, uh, one of the other um, racial equity panels that I went to yeah, turned out inclusive leadership, which ended be, ended up being, I, it was kind of a different perspective and it was really interesting because they talked about um, uh, diversity along a number of axes uh, in, in addition to the kinds of things of race and religion and socioeconomic level and that kind of thing that we usually think of um, and and how to encourage you know diversity along all kinds of axes. Um, I went to a couple of panels that had to do with uh, legislation and guidelines. Title IX was one and um, there was a second one about policies that are affecting LGBTQ students, um, and another one about legislative issues that are coming up federally. And then finally, I went to a couple of panels. I was inspired by the third the third keynote speaker of the weekend, who was Sean Aker, who wrote yes. The Happiness Advantage, which mm -hmm. is a best-selling book. And um, so there were a couple of panels that also touched on that kind of positive psychology and talking about um, hope and engagement among kids. And so I thought I attended some of those as well. I also got his book. I read it, so it was, uh, Do you, you bought his book? I got it from the library. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's good stuff. Great. Um, I see we have a, a question. Uh, Ms. Kinahan, can we unmute her? Uh, this is our little Compton rep. Yeah. It's good. It's we're working to unmute Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, the recognition. And I just wanted to point out, I was at the RIASC meeting as well. Oh, and um, you you did not mention um, that so many of you on the Portsmouth School Committee were recognized as members of the um, Leadership Academy. In fact, some of you have spent quite a few hours dedicated to professional development. I don't know if you um, want to recognize everyone, including yourself. Emily, but uh, it was really quite impressive. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Is it Mr. Vadney who's done over 500 hours, I think? 
<laughs> he is our most dedicated member. Right? <laughs> you are quite dedicated. I just wanted to point that out. And congratulations to all of you. Well, thank you. Thank On you. The negative side, of you. We didn't. We usually have done really well having uh, all of our Portsmouth School Committee members get their six hours. So we're usually recognized for that. Unfortunately, this time I forget who was it. It was only one. Socket. There was only one district. Yeah, when Socket was not there, yeah. the only school committee that achieved. I mean, granted, COVID. COVID, COVID not yeah. having any uh, any professional development uh, from from Riesk, a lot of it. Okay, um, I don't want to cut you off. No. That was it. Okay, um, so um, uh, I went to uh, sessions that focused on. Um, um, governance issues with school committees and districts. And so I went to um, high performing school committees, um, superintendent evaluation, best practices, um, goal setting linked to uh, the strategic plan. Uh, but I also, I have to mention, I also went to that positive um, psychology uh, presentation with the happiness advantage. Um, uh, Dr. Viveros, I don't know if you're familiar with that book, but if you guys are doing a, a district read uh, among administrators, I, 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 one I definitely want to read. I mean, um, it really talked, uh, I also went to the HOPE panel as well. Um, it really was, I would say, one of the most inspiring um, talks I, I think I've heard in my entire, um, you know, work on the school committee in terms of of not just kind of uh, improving performance, but really positive differences in kids. Uh, I mean, if half of what he was talking about holds up, it, it could be really incredibly transformational. I, I just thought it was a really, really powerful presentation. Um, so, but uh, what I would, uh, so um, what they did on the high performing school committees was talk about a number of best practices. And I'm pleased to report we do a lot of them already, um, you know, in terms of our subcommittee structures involving all members of the committee and, and work in the committee. And some of it was really uh, targeted to much larger districts um, than ours, you know, where it was, I think, in some ways much more formal. Um, but what I would really like to do is I would like to propose that for our workshop and August that we do take, um, you know, um, school committee performance and and uh, and put that on the agenda, and really go through um, the list of some of their best practices and see if there's things there that um, we might want to adopt for the coming year. Um, and then they also talked about um, goal setting and linking it to the strategic plan. One of the things I took away that I thought. You know, we've been so consumed with COVID, rightly so, this past year, but but next year, you know, really making an effort to um, have an, an item on the agenda that's linked to the strategic plan and, and how we're moving things along, maybe not every meeting, but, you know, once a month or something, um, and, and really make that very much sort of front and, and center of some of our reporting back. So um, I won't say it was a hugely enjoyable conference because sitting on Zoom for an entire weekend is uh, not something I'd recommend, but I do think there, some of the panels were really, really pretty worth worthwhile to hear. Maybe really sympathize with our, our teachers and our students. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very much so. Okay, um, any questions, comments? Did I miss anybody? Uh, doing anything. I was hoping to catch everything. Okay, great. Um, so moving on to uh, subcommittee update, personnel subcommittee um, is the first one on the agenda. Uh, we met uh, last week and reviewed the uh, three contracts that are coming um, before us tonight under the business agenda um, and um, uh, move them forward to the full committee. So I think we'll, we'll wait till we get down there. Um, the other thing we talked about um, was uh, uh, considering um, uh, a while back we had talked about, you know, did we want to explore the idea of merit um, as a potential bonus or something? So that was something that um, we thought about. Is that something that we want to revisit? Uh, we don't really have a policy on it, but that was the last item on our agenda. Obviously, that was just more for um, discussion. Um, and that was it from the personnel subcommittee, uh, policy subcommittee. So the policy subcommittee met yesterday and um, we discussed three different policies. The first was our anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policy. The second was the Title IX sexual harassment policy. And the third was 
um, a policy having to do with health examination screenings and immunization. Um, we made some revisions to the policies and then uh, voted to move all three of them to the full school committee at our next meeting. So those will be coming up next time. Next, they're not on this meeting then. Not today. Okay. All right. That's right, because you met yesterday. They couldn't be. Okay. Um, great. Uh, moving on to our favorite part of the agenda, uh, recognitions. Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. Uh, Steve, if we could unmute Margie Brennan. And while uh, we are doing that, I will uh, introduce. So we asked Margie to come forward specifically this evening. Uh, she is also going to recognize a number of individuals who helped to contribute to this effort. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were able to announce that uh, back in April, in conjunction with Earth Day, the U.S. Department of Education announced this year's Green Ribbon Award recipients in the Portsmouth School District as an entire district was uh, one of two winners in Rhode Island. So we were the, uh, we're the only full district in Rhode Island so far to receive this award. Uh, this recognition has been given out by the Department of Education for about the last 10 years. I think most people are more familiar on the academic uh, excellence side, the blue ribbon. And uh, while we're always striving toward that as well, uh, this is, is not a, a, a bad uh, recognition. Uh, uh, the green ribbon um, is uh, in the area of environmental uh, education and, and sustainability. Uh, so it represents a lot of hard work that's taken place throughout the district. Uh, Margie was uh, certainly uh, the, you know, spearheaded this effort, but I know she has a few other people she wants to recognize and uh, anything else that you wanna say about the award, Margie? Um, before we do that, maybe if we stop sharing the agenda and put her on full screen, there we go. Now we'll be able to see her. Let's, can we put her on uh, individual speaker view? And she, there we go. Mm. Ah. I don't know if I would have came if you told me you were gonna put me on big screen. <laughs> 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 Um, all I did was put together a collection of work that the district has been doing for a number of years. And um, I think this district uh, probably could have gotten this award sooner. The nice thing to know is that our district was the only um, district in the Northeast to receive this um, award as well. So everybody West Coast uh, was acknowledged, but we were the only one in the East Coast. That was kind of neat to hear too. But having said that, um, I pestered a lot of people for three and a half months to collect information and evidence to make this possible. And I just wanna um, recognize them if you don't mind. Uh, Rachel Marcinio was very instrumental. She did a lot of the policy work for me. Um, Matt Murphy, I actually called him back up just because he had done so much work in the past and had so much knowledge about the buildings. Uh, Sarah Chergan is an, very instrumental in gaining this award. She put a lot of work into Melville and she's uh, a new partner of mine. So she's uh, definitely put a lot of work to help me put the information together. Um, JP Arsenal up at the high school does amazing work and uh, he helped a lot, but his work absolutely helped us a lot for sure. Um, Jim Dean helped out for what he could fill in for what he knew. And of course, um, Danielle Lori, Lisa Little and Joao Arruda um, helped giving me the permission to um, take time out of their day and they joined our subcommittees. I had Erica Midgilton and Karen Moore and Karen Ang Anganetti um, help out in the teaching academic aspect. And then the health and wellness aspect, I also had um, Nicole Pasco, Dan Donna Powell and Nelia Almeida. And uh, for parents, Sarah Chorgan represented parents, but I also had, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say his name wrong, uh, Jason um, Spitnalnik. Um, who is uh, very um, heavily in the environmental um, business and he was able to give me some uh, great information as well. So they are definitely to thank for, for helping me collect all this information. So thank you for recognizing. Thank you, Margie, Ken, and, and everybody who helped to contribute. <laughs> thank you. Is this an annual award that we, is this something that we would apply for every year or do you get it no, sort of kinda, once again, and it's that's the it? the equivalent of, of uh, you know, the best analogy is the blue ribbon. Like once you're a green ribbon award recipient, you get, you keep that title. Yeah. <laughs> right, Margie? Where, where do we go from here? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. if we reach the top, 
we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll look for uh, any other uh, things in this area, certainly. Absolutely. Well, Margie, I know you're being very generous with uh, recognizing everybody else, but I think we also know that uh, you're a lot of the, the driving force behind this and a lot of these activities. So I think you as an individual. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. Can't do it without the support of administration. So I appreciate the availability and the, the flexibility they give me in my job. I'm definitely lucky to be in the position that I'm in. We're, we're lucky to have you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess we don't even have a certificate or anything to give out, we're just. Uh, we can certainly do that. We have, uh, but I, we just wanted to right? make sure that we, we got the uh, recognition out there for Margie and all the individuals. Uh. Doesn't the Department of Education provide something? Not, you know, like a certificate, they must provide something. Uh, Margie, have, have we physically yeah. received anything? Uh, in the fall, I know that the um, they're doing something in Washington, D.C. They've invited um, a representative or two down to um, receive a, um, a, a, a certificate, I guess, from um, the White House. Oh, all right. Very exciting. And we do have, uh, you, you know, may, may not have noticed it, but there is, uh, we are now able to display, if you go to our, our web page, there's a green ribbon recognition there that we get to display now. So great. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. Thanks, everybody. And thank you. Uh, Margie, thank you especially. So thank you. Um, okay. Uh, public comment. Does anybody, would anybody like to? Say anything, raise a hand, chat, not seeing anything, not wanting to cut anybody off, but okay. Uh, moving on to our presentation tonight, we have, um, we have the Portsmouth uh, Prevention uh, Coalition here to give their presentation. Looking forward to it. We haven't heard from you yet this year, so very exciting. So Steve, we, yep, we want to unmute um, that. Uh, also, Andrea Paiva, and uh, I saw Esther Herlock's name, I think, here. So her as well, she's on. Tom, will they be sharing, or would you like for me to share? Uh, yeah, why don't you share, Liz? Uh, they probably don't have share rights. Uh, so we're getting everybody set up. I will just introduce, as Dr. Copeland mentioned, uh, our presentation this evening will be from the Portsmouth Prevention Coalition. So uh, they are a great partner uh, for, for us uh, in you know prevention work. Uh, you know, with, with our, our students. Uh, and there's a lot of great activities that people are aware of that the, the coalition does each year. So typically we, uh, you know, at least once, if, if not um, more times per school year, we'll have members of the coalition on to give updates. So we wanted to make sure that we did that this evening. Uh, so I don't know who would like to begin. Sure, I'll, I'll kick us off. Thank you, Dr. Right. Kimberly. It's good to see you. You know, I'm gonna interrupt for a second because I sure. see that uh, our needs assessment, I think the PowerPoint that I forwarded was last year's PowerPoint. And I'm wondering oh, if we're oh. able to share, if we can share our screen, um, we can pull up the correct one. I apologize. I, I can share it. That's okay. I have it up on my computer. Okay, why don't we give Esther the ability to share, Steve? I apologize for that. It's okay. Thank, good catch, Nancy. Yeah, no, <laughs> Before I, we got started. Yeah, yeah thank you. That was the one that you wanted to share, Nancy. Yes, uh, I thought it was too. <laughs> uh, let me just pull it up here. Give me one second. I have a few. Um... Well, Esther's pulling that up. I do want to thank the school department for all the support that they give to the prevention coalition. Uh, you know, Chris, Chris Diorio helps us out immensely and everybody has been very supportive of us. So uh, that's very, really appreciated. So, so go ahead, Esther. All righty. Well, thank you guys so much for having us. So we just wanted to briefly go over the community survey that, um, it went out uh, around December of last year. Um, so we have quite, we had quite a few people participate, um, actually more than we had the previous year. I'm guessing because everyone was virtual and on their computers, we had more participation. So I really appreciate you guys completing the survey for us. It really, really does help inform the work that we do. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about um, what the community survey is. It really was just to get 
kind of a feel for the community's awareness around prevention, about who we are, um, about how they see their own health behaviors and about their perceptions of youth substance use as well as their own. So um, Andrea Pava helped us um, develop this community survey and push it out. And I just kind of um, pushed it out through social media on any meetings we we're on. And Nancy's always um, around to help us with this as well. And she's been stepping in um, to help our coalition um, during the last few months while I was on maternity leave. And she's gonna be around a little bit longer as well. Um, so as I said, we had quite a few complete this survey. Um, it was at about 119 people. Um, last, uh, the previous year we only had 59. So we're very happy with that number. And this just br briefly gives you the breakdown of who completed the survey. So you'll see that we had more female complete the survey. We had quite a few members from our military families, which is always good to hear from them. Um, with them moving constantly, we always wanna see how they're feeling about our communities. Um, and about 33% worked in Portsmouth. 80% um, uh, were parents of Portsmouth students, which is a really interesting number for you guys uh, to, to look at, because this is, um, really reflective of what the parents are thinking of, what our students are, are experiencing, um, especially throughout this past year during COVID. We really wanted to get a feel for um, what everybody was, what they perceived was happening around behaviors, health behaviors, and um, use, use of any substances. Um, and 70, about 78% were a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, so Andrew's going to go over the specific data points, but I just wanted to point out that we are going to be comparing our, um, th this past year's number with the previous year um, of the 2019 community survey. So um, we're going to do that where it's applicable. Um, the numbers are a bit different, so it's not directly comparable, but it's at least a good way for us to see where, where, we've, where we've been, where we're going, what it looked like especially with COVID happening. So I'm gonna pass it along to Andrea if she wants to go ahead and talk about the frequency of substance use that we found. Sure, great. Um, yeah, so our goal here was really to follow up what we had done in 2019, uh, trying to see some trends. Uh, as Esther mentioned, we have a pretty small sample size overall, 59 people in 2019. Um, about double that in 2020, which is fabulous, but just kind of keeping that in mind. Um, we don't like to directly compare or say anything statistically different, but just kind of looking at trend data so we could get a sense of what's going on. Um, obviously, the prevention coalition really cares about both um, community uh, substance use as well as the perceptions and what they're thinking about with use, substance use, because it's super important for us to be able to understand that. And being able to target our messaging and figure out where we may need to focus in the future, um, you know, is really helpful. So when we started looking at some of this, um, looking at frequency of substance use, this is their own substance use. So some people might say, well, prevention mostly focuses on kids, but we know that especially in the world of COVID, our kids are always watching us. My 11 year old is watching me right now, sitting right here. So, um, so we know that they're always keeping an eye on what we're doing. And so we like to better understand what's happening in the community and prevention goes beyond just the youth. It's also for all of the adults and, and we aim a lot of our messaging there. So as you can kind of see here, just generally, I could harp on every slide for a long time because I'm a data person, but just trying to draw your eye a little bit too the things that are people are doing the most, um, about 40% were drinking alcohol, um, either weekly or daily in 2019. That's up a tiny bit in 2020. We've seen a lot in media and the news just talking about people coping differently and, and engaging in some of these behaviors a little more. We are seeing that a little bit more with the binge drinking, five or more drinks, um, either weekly or daily. Um, up from 1.7 to about 5%. Again, these aren't the same people, but we're generalizing a little bit. Um, and then everything else for the most part stayed pretty similar. Um, and some of the numbers, you know, you can look more, I'm sure you, this will be sent around. Um, yeah, so you can go to the next slide. So again, what we care about as well is what they're thinking about as far as the approval or disapproval of youth using substances. Now, of course, for the most part, this is uh, about 80% parents. We would assume that 
most are strongly disapproving of these substance use among youth. Um, and you see that, especially using um, alcohol daily, binge drinking, you're, we're seeing almost 100% reporting that they strongly disapprove. Some of the things that we're seeing going down a little bit is smoking cigarettes. Of course, we're still on the high end here. Um, you know, it's obviously mostly that everyone's disapproving. Um, but I think a few of those to know, we kind of anything that dropped around three percentage points is what we noticed here. And one of the things is um, particularly in interesting is the uh, marijuana use, um, that disapproval of marijuana use is going down. Um, this is particularly of interest as we move forward through the process of legalization in the state, which will probably happen next year, um, and just general attitudes. So again, just something for us to be noting. Um, again, overall, lots of disapproval, which is what we wanna see. Um, but it's the job of the prevention coalition as well to keep these disapproval rates high. And so something like that marijuana use might be something to note that we may need to continue to do more work on marijuana and understand and get that point across to parents as well as community members. So that's sort of the highlight between 2019 and 2020 um, as far as youth. Um, when we talk about adults, we also care, right? So if, if I disapprove of something for adults, um, I also care about youth. So we looked at these same things. Now, when we talk about strongly disapproving adult substance use, again, we're not really talking about the fact that, you know, we think that adults shouldn't drink or shouldn't do um, some legal behaviors that as adults were, it's a different, you know, it's a different beast that we're dealing with. But as you can see overall, um, the disapproval rate for adult use is, it's almost the complete opposite, right? As we'd probably expect. Um, but some of the things, again, sort of noting uh, the differences in, over the past year, which is not a unique year with COVID, um, but just that some of the uh, disapproval is going down even a little bit more with uh, things like binge drinking, um, the disapproval of marijuana actually went up with adults, which again, we're not really looking statistically, but just kind of noting that. Um, and then other things like uh, prescription drugs and illegal drugs also going up. So can't really talk too much about why, but just kind of noting what, what these perception are in the, the community themselves. Um, another thing that we wanted to focus on, because while we are focused a lot on substance use, that's the primary thing we're caring about, right? Um, but really we're interested in wellness. We're also interested in the interaction that we know exists between well-being, uh, mental health, and substance use. So we looked at this, which is very wordy, but I will just kind of boil it down pretty quickly, which is basically we ask questions to uh, participants, uh, you know, these community members asking where they feel they are now as far as how they're doing and where they see themselves in five years. And this is a well-developed uh, scale that can really get a better understanding of whether people are struggling, thriving, or suffering. And so this was something I was particularly interested in because in 2019, you can kind of see where Majority of our participants were thriving, um, kind of like a good sense of well being, fewer health problems, having overall fewer sick days, that kind of thing is related to being thriving and or feeling thriving. About 71% fell in that category while uh, the rest of the people were struggling and no one was really reporting or categorized as suffering. Um, fast forward through pretty much um, six months of um, everyone being um, in their house and COVID and all the things we, we struggled with. Um, you can see that the number of people that fell into that category of thriving went down by over 10%. And some people actually felt are that they are suffering. Again, we're not straight out asking them those questions. We're asking a few questions related to it and then categorizing them here and more people were struggling. So again, that's not something I think that's um, very earth shattering. We probably expect this direction, especially during COVID, um, but it would be nice, especially when we do this again next year to kind of see how things start to, to turn and um, see if some of that lingers, but just kind of get a sense of, 
of where people are as far as well being, which is just as important to us in figuring out so how that relates to substance use, um, which could also very much be correlated to increase in substance use. Okay. Um, a few other things that we looked at, specifically we added for this 2020 administration of this survey is looking at COVID-19 and different behaviors, including alcohol consumption. We were wondering if we just flat out asked people if they were engaging in more substance use. Um, we particularly asked if they were drinking more um, than before COVID or you know, during COVID. So alcohol consumption rose as we saw from 13.6% to 17.3%. 11% um, of people reported that they had actually ordered alcohol as takeout, which is sort of a new phenomenon. I um, was kind of thinking back to my days when I was a server and we had to jump through all these hoops for anyone to take their wine home. And here we are actually having some drive-through restaurants in the state where you could actually just pick up your alcohol and drive through or have it delivered with um, relatively no ID checking. Um, there's different you know, websites to do that. So we were just wondering if people were utilizing it and they were. Um, and we also wanted to look a little bit about stress, right? So we talked about well-being, but we also wanna know, are people engaging in more stress management exercises? So I know part of what we've done at the schools um, part of what I see online really pushed out to everyone is we're all stressed. Here's some free yoga. Here's meditation. I know I've utilized some of those myself. And so we wanted to know, are people engaging in stress ma management activities? Because we want to know if they're doing the healthy things to manage that. And in fact, pre-COVID in 2019, 9.8% um, reported that they were doing some stress management activities. And that went all the way up to 33%. So even without any stats in there, um, that's pretty significant. So a lot of what everyone's trying to do to support people, likely working, so that way they can try to keep some of that stress down. Um, but of course, we still feel the effects of it. But it's nice to know that people are still trying to engage in those healthy stress management activities. And they're doing that more now, post-COVID. Thanks, Andrea. Before we move on um, to the next slide, which Nancy will go over, I just wanted to ask if at this point anyone has any questions for us about the data, any questions for Andrea, or anything about the coalition, um, we would take those questions at this time. Mr. Ferber? I, I just have one question. How many surveys did you send out? Just out of curiosity. Um, so it was an online survey. Yeah, so we just started, pushed it out through social media. I know the school shared it. Um, did a lot of social sharing, so it wasn't actually a printed survey to, okay. to hand out. Was your, I mean, the response, the response rate, I think you had 119 responses, so it, it seems like it might be low relative to the number that you requested. Definitely. It's definitely still a very small, probably selective group as we look at that, so it's hard to really make big claims with it, but just kind of a little snapshot. Thank you. I think those are the questions I'm seeing here. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next slide and hand it off to Nancy. So uh, as uh, Esther alluded to, Esther's uh, taking her maternity leave and turning it into a maternity resignation. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're going to be missing her. And so that we have this, I wanted to put this out there. Um, we are looking for a coalition director. And those that's up on our website as well as the town website and we will be we're hoping to hire um certainly by um the middle of june or um the uh applications are are due in the end of next week and we're hoping to uh replace esther quickly and i will be staying on um as an interim coordinator director um as we as we find that new person. And then at the same time, uh, after we hire a director, we will be looking to um, fill another position as a youth coordinator. 
So we'll be doing some hiring uh, over the summer. So anybody that is interested in that position, uh, take a look at this. Um, we will, we wanna continue servicing um, and cooperating with the schools and the community um, to provide prevention activities. So we're hoping to fill this position quickly. Um, and that, that's it for our uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Kenworthy, I will make sure that the correct PowerPoint gets emailed to, um, to Heather um, so that you have it for your records. So I, I do apologize again for, for messing that up. No so thank you so much. And thank, thank you for all that you do for the, for the school district. I, I, I actually have a question. Um, you know, have you, and it's probably hard to answer if it sounds like we're changing a lot of personnel and staff here for next year, but uh, given the, the post-COVID plans for next year, are you planning on doing, or is there an idea to do more sort of wellness, um, <clears throat> social, emotional wellness uh, activities in the schools or those kind of efforts? As a matter of fact, we had a very successful, maybe Mr. Aruda can um, help, or not Mr. Aruda, but Ms. Um, Ms. Ms. Uh, yes, Mr. Aruda was the one who was dealing with our, our uh, mindfulness program that I think was very successful this past um, semester. And um, we're hoping to actually, we'd love to see that expanded in the fall, you know, whether it goes into the high school as well. And we're, we're always trying to, match what's going on in the school with what we can provide for you that, um, you know, we really reach across and um, take that substance abuse prevention and really try to blanket it over the community as to what the needs are. And certainly that social and emotional uh, well-being is uh, a very big part of what we do. So yes, thank you. I think Mr. Aruda, did you want to say something? Yeah, let me, well, can we unmute Mr. Aruda? I just wanted to say that this was the very first experience that, that we had with the uh, South Kingston yoga. And it was a very, very good experience that we had with grades five and six this year. And we hope to continue uh, through the remainder of this school year and for next school year also. It was a very good ex experience for the students. And thank you to the coalition for sponsoring it. Thank you. Okay. So um, any, any other questions? Otherwise, thank you very much for your report and Esther, good luck. And uh, we hope that we are equally successful in finding a, a great replacement for uh, this next year, right? Um, thank you, Esther. Thank you. Um, okay, that was our uh, presentation for the night. Uh, turning to Dr. Kenworthy's update. Thank you. Uh, so first up, a uh, no, personnel update. Um, just wanted to highlight uh, any uh, individuals uh, you know, who we've brought on since the last school committee meeting. And I do also have a couple of uh, late retirement notices that came in. Uh, so we were happy to uh, bring on to fill a vacancy that we had in, in an RBT paraprofessional position, Ms. Uh, Annie Heffernan. And Annie had been a, a, a sub for us in the district for a number of years. Uh, her mom is a teacher in the district. Her sister help, has been helping us out for the last few years. So it's a, a well-known family. Uh, so she'll be filling that role for the remainder of the school year at Portsmouth Middle School. Uh, we also have a, a number of coaching uh, appointments to read off. So we are entering now our you know, it's been now the fourth and final of the abbreviated seasons uh, for middle and high school athletics. So everything has, has gone off very successfully. And uh, we, uh, we certainly are expecting that to continue. Um, probably ask Mr. Tresvant to come on at the next meeting to just do kind of a recap of season three, which just finished up and uh, any, any highlights at that point for uh, season four. Uh, but we will have, um, for our season four coaches at Portsmouth Middle School, uh, softball head coach uh, Ryan Soares, track and field head coach Nancy Mendonca, uh, assistant track and field coach at Portsmouth Middle School Ellen Chilabato, and head baseball coach at Portsmouth Middle School Kevin Weaver. At Portsmouth High School, uh, head baseball coach Matt McGuire, assistant baseball coaches Jonathan Lewis and Michael Sherman. 
uh, boys tennis coach, Mark Hedden, boys track and field head coach, Sean Horgan, uh, assistant boys track and field coach, Evan Denard. Uh, excuse me. Uh, and we have girls track and field head coach, Jeff Rose, assistant track and field coach for the girls, Robin McFetters. Uh, head softball coach, Mario Ochi. Uh, we had an assistant Christine softball Higgins. coach, Christine Higgins. There we go. Uh, assistant softball coach, Christine Higgins. And uh, golf coach, Gary Sykes with assistant golf coach, Tyler Angers. So uh, congratulations and to all those individuals and thank you for helping us out in those areas. I also did just want to uh, mention a couple of late retirement notices that we had come in. Uh, Robin Friccioni, who's been a special education teacher at Portsmouth Middle School the last few years, long time, uh, served in that role for a long time at Portsmouth High School. So she did announce that she will be retiring at the end of the school year, as will Michelle Medeiros, who's in a clerical role currently at Melville School, has worked in a number of positions. Uh, both of these individuals are longtime employees of the district. Uh, also, um, I will be uh, asking for school committee approval uh, for uh, our director of college and career readiness, but we'll talk more about that in the business portion. Those are the personnel updates. Uh, for district updates, I uh, wanted to highlight a few things uh, since the last meeting uh, when we returned from April break. It's been great to welcome back. Uh, all of our students to full in-person learning activities now. So we've really come a long way from where we were a year ago. Uh, we have about 95% of our families taking advantage of full in-person activities. We still have a few families who uh, asked to remain in distance learning for the end of this school year. I just wanna again take the opportunity to thank all in the PSD community for their continued cooperation and efforts of, of everything that we've had to undertake this school year. Uh, we are, of course, the, the changes now seem to be coming in, uh, you know, very, uh, very uh, quickly, number of changes each week. So we're trying to incorporate as much as we can into our current protocols for this year, but also turning an eye, of course, to our planning for next year. So when I have more definitive information to announce, um, I will certainly bring that forward for next school year. Uh, also wanted to thank uh, this. We were asked to turn this around very quickly. Uh, but thank you to the individuals on the town side who worked in collaboration with us in the school department and also a lot of uh, community volunteers who, uh, you know, thought that uh, we, you know, we had, we had uh, stood down the vac municipal vaccine clinic at Raytheon, but we called um, a lot of people back into service. Uh, each high school was asked to host a vaccination clinic, primarily for 16 to 18 year old students. Um, and we were also able to open that up to any household family members, staff members. Again, this was really seen as just one, one last effort to get you know, anybody vaccinated who hadn't had a chance to schedule an appointment in, in that age group. I think what, what we're certainly finding in, in this area, and we're hearing that in, in a lot of suburban communities, is that most people, once an age group opens up, you know, most people who uh, want to get vaccinated are able to schedule their appointments. So we're not, we're not seeing great demand. With that being said, 100, uh, close to 100 individuals were vaccinated through this clinic. So um, it's 100 more people than were vaccinated uh, or well on their way to being fully vaccinated um, you know, from a week ago. So again, thank you to everyone who helped out with that effort. And uh, you may be following uh, the news closely. The FDA did just approve um, the vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. Uh, so there is speculation that we may be asked to host clinics for that age group as well. Again, we'll, you know, we'll work with town officials to see what we can do if, if we are asked to do so. Uh, I wanted to congratulate Portsmouth High School. So uh, over the last few weeks, we received the great news. Uh, the U.S. News and World Report rankings for high schools came out. And Portsmouth High School, uh, as we have for the past few years, uh, held a very solid ranking there of uh, number four in the state of Rhode Island. Um, you know, this is really noteworthy. Uh, obviously, it's a culmination of, of a lot of dedication and hard work on, on our behalf of our high school staff, but also, you know, really, this is a reflection uh, you know, of our entire district as, you know, it really, really takes a lot of effort, PK through 12, um, you know, to, uh, as students build up to high school. Um, 
So within that ranking, again, you know, last few years that, you know, we've, we've solidly been in that top four, uh, the schools, uh, you know, at the high school level who usually rank above us, uh, Barrington and East Greenwich. And then we have classical high school. Classical is a full exam prep school in Providence. So, you know, students have to have to take an entrance exam and, you know, they only take, you know, the, the highest percentage of students who, who score on that exam. Uh, Barrington and East Greenwich are, are well known um, for their academic achievements and, uh, community efforts there. So, um, you know, that is, that's good company for us to be in. Uh, you know, I, I would point out where one, one thing, you know, that we're dealing with there that, um, you know, those districts and a lot of other districts certainly do not is, um, you know, our military population. It's great for us. Uh, you know, we really enjoy that collaboration, but, you know, we have about a 20% military um, family connection as we, uh, we do point out from time to time, you know, so uh, while that brings a lot of you know, great things and value to our district, it does mean that, you know, about every three years, one way or another, we're, we're turning students over. They're either leaving our district or new students are coming in. Uh, so again, for us to, to be able to be in that company uh, speaks volumes to uh, a lot of the efforts and hard work. Uh, lastly, uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, some end of year activities. So a lot of things are being planned in, in all of our schools. I think at the elementary and middle school, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of great things for students before the end of the year. Most of those will uh, have been already planned, so they will continue to be virtual. You know, there will be some outdoor activities as we get closer to the end of the school year. Uh, but at the high school level, particularly, we have three key in-person events that the high school is working hard to uh, make sure that we're, you know, uh, meeting all of the Rhode Island Department of Health requirements. So uh, at the end of this month on May 26th, we're gonna have our annual National Honor Society induction. And we're gonna be able to hold that, you know, in, in a safe uh, in-person socially distant ceremony. I know the uh, uh, high school is pleased to be able to offer an, you know, an in-person senior prom for our senior class. That's gonna be held on June 9th at the Atlantic Resort in Newport. And of course, uh, graduation for the class of 2021, which will be held on Friday, June 11th. Um, that will be, you know, as close as we can get uh, to, you know, typical, you know, in-person ceremony. We will have that outdoors here on the grounds of Portsmouth High School. So we're, we're inching back to some normalcy there as well. Very, very exciting. I know the, the seniors and, and junior prom as well, or no? Uh, I... I believe they are trying to work on some sort of activity. I don't, I don't want to um, misspeak. I know I've seen communications going back and forth. I, I, I know that the senior, you know, a senior prom set, I think they're trying to plan something for the junior, but I don't have those final details. That's, that's very exciting. Very, very exciting. Questions for the superintendent, anybody? No? All right, audience questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. Um, moving on to um, some more of the business parts here. Can I have an approval of school committee minutes, please? I move for the approval of the uh, regular school committee minutes and the executive session minutes of April 13th. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Unanimous, 7-0. Uh, can I have a motion for the consent agenda, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous seven zero, uh, Dr. Kenworthy. Uh, there's nothing on there, right? We don't, uh, no, we don't. There's no announcement. Sorry, no, my bad. No, no, thanks, sorry, no. Okay, uh, moving on to business I item A, this, please. I move for discussion and action of the fiscal fiscal year 2022 operating budget with town council adjustments. Second, Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Viveras, we're we're going to get up that uh, budget presentation uh, that should be linked to the backup. Uh, so the presentation is actually going to connect to uh, both uh, business item A and B. So what we wanted to bring, um, is since, since our last meeting, we had the uh, town council uh, budget hearing and uh, you know, we presented the school department budget and um, the town council did make some adjustments. So Mr. DRO uh, worked through uh, those adjustments. So do we not have that, Dr. Viveros? Uh, it's... I do have it, but it's um, not not um, cooperating. To flip it. But like, <laughs> I can share, but it's um, not facing the right direction. You got to download it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to town council did take a, a couple of actions that evening, and I will. Uh, Mr. Diro is on to, of course, uh, provide a lot of the um, final details there. But what I can tell you, uh, you know, we had much discussion on the formulation of our budget. Uh, we. Sure. We went Please, in. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Sorry. Uh, we went in with an overall uh, what you approved uh, back at the end of March was an overall expenditure increase of uh, 1.7 percent, uh, which would have resulted in a town appropriation increase of 2.5 percent. So, with the actions the town council took that evening, which Mr. Dura will will get into the details of, um, we. We now have uh, a, an overall operating budget um, that represents a 1.5% uh, expenditure increase and a 2.3% town appropriation increase. So uh, business item A pertains to the operating budget. So uh, Chris. Yeah, uh, Liz, if you can go down to uh, one more page. <clears throat> Perfect, thank you. So at, at the very bottom, um, you can see the adjustments uh, that the town council um, had made uh, when they provisionally approved our budget at their last meeting. Um, there were three um, health uh, care premiums. Uh, we had had uh, an estimate into our budget by the time uh, the school committee approved it and submitted it to the town administrator. Um, we didn't have actual premiums. Uh, between that time and the town council's meeting, uh, we did. So for both health and dental, uh, we just swapped out our estimates uh, and put in the actual premium amounts. So that was a reduction in uh, health care expenditures of 40488 and uh, dental of 6318 And then uh, also there was a uh, <clears throat> motion uh, by the town council to transfer from the school department's budget to the police department's budget, the full cost of the two SROs uh, for our schools. Uh, we had been splitting the cost. And so we had $80,000 on our budget, uh, which was removed and will now be uh, picked up by the police department. So as Dr. Kenworthy said, uh, we went from a 1.8% uh, overall expenditure increase to a 1.5%. You can see that at the bottom. And Liz, if you can go back one page. Okay, that's revenue. So you can see, uh, again, at the bottom, um, we made a corresponding adjustment to our town appropriation of $126,806, uh, which now has um, an overall revenue increase of 1.5, corresponding with our expenditures, and a town appropriation of 2.3%. Any questions? I mean, I, I would just make a comment that uh, I understand why the the town did this to put the police SROs in, or the, the school contribution to the SROs and the police budget. But I would just add, I think it, it really uh, contributes to the problem of, um, you know, ride looking at the amount of money that the schools are funded by the town and, and this, you know, to me just tends to compli complicate it. But um, I think the good thing is, is that the SROs are, are funded. And I think that's, you know, hopefully our, our primary uh, objective there. Um, I should know the answer to this question, but is are the um, school resource office, they're funded partially by a grant, I think, right? And isn't uh, this the last year? Yeah, that no, not any longer. That, that grant had expired as of next year. So we had our, that, you know, we had always contributed $40,000, which was half the cost of one for next year with the elimination of the grant, we had been asked to, you know, have $80,000 $80, to contribute to uh, the, you know, half, basically half the cost of two. That was the motion that was made that evening was to just transfer that money out of our budget into the police department budget. Were, were we rejected for a, an additional grant application? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know all of the details. So I don't want to misspeak on it. I know that there was, it was, it was an initial application and then we got a one year, we had an extension last year, which they only granted for one year. Okay. So we need, we have a, a motion and a second uh, 
action and we need to approve the budget so that it's in line with what the town council approves. Um, so not hearing any further questions or discussion, uh, call the vote. Uh, all, in, all in favor? Uh, all opposed? 6-1 uh, passed. And do I need to say for the record? Mm -hmm. yeah, do I have to say who voted for me then? Because uh, we're virtually. I think, I think you do when yeah. we're. I think we're I do because we're anything, virtually. Anything that's not unanimous, yes. Okay, if it's, if it's not unanimous, we can stay for the record. Uh, in uh, opposing, Alan Beard. All right. Um, so we'll discussion and action on the fiscal year 2022 capital budget with town council adjustments. I need a second. <laughs> Okay. We'll move to the last page of that presentation. Uh, so, so same thing. Uh, we just wanted to make sure we, we fully updated and that you had an opportunity to vote based on the actions the town council took. So that evening we presented uh, what had been uh, the, the school committee approved capital request. I'll let Mr. Deere get into details, but the uh, you know, town council uh, basically that evening um, you know, asked us to fully fund our capital request. So that, that would be the key part of this vote this evening. Chris? Yeah, exactly. So um, our, our submission to the town administrator included a capital project um, totaling $528,000. It's a roofing project at the high school. Uh, we were proposing to uh, fund that at the time um, with $469,000 of new town capital and $59,000 of existing town capital, um, which were which was savings from a project we had completed this past summer. Um, ultimately, in their provisional approval, um, they did not provide uh, any capital uh, for us for next year uh, and asked us to fund that project uh, using school funds uh, from our own capital projects fund. Uh, so therefore, uh, this budget uh, request has been revised uh, to show that the, if you look in the middle of the page, uh, we still would like to do the project for $528,000. Only this time um, we're asking to use $469,000 of school uh, capital project funds uh, and 59,000 of town existing funds from uh, last year's project for a total cost of 528,000. And again, just to be clear, I know we already talked about this, but um, there, there is no housing aid on this project, but I just want to mention that again. Hey, questions, comments, Mr. Shears. Uh, uh, in this area, I just, I've said this a few times over the years, but I don't know whether the town also understands, hopefully they do, that we have approximately 450,000 square feet of improvements in the town right now between the school buildings and the administration to replace that at the current cost, which is skyrocketing, so I put in 600, it's $650 a square foot. So to replace those, the buildings would be 292,500,000 going with those factors. Putting aside 1%, 1% a year for maintenance and whatnot on the buildings, would be 2925000 I just want to bring out to the public, to everyone, we're so far behind the dollars that you should be allocating to maintain properties. We do a terrific job for what we have, but it's, it's like trying to run around with, with uh, a nickel where, where you need a dollar. And so I'm just saying that this, these numbers that we're looking at are, are so small to what is needed. And I don't wanna put a negative response to the people that are working and trying to maintain as we go, but this is like putting a finger in the dike. And, and so somewhere along the line, somebody has to come to the realization of what we're working with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. How much do we have left in the um, capital fund after this? After this should be about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. 
And we would use, I mean, that's kind of in case there's an emergency, we have to dip into that. Mm -hmm. But we also have in our emergency fund. Right. And we need to provide a 1% maintenance of effort, right? Would this cover it? Uh, yeah, we, we need to provide 2.5% um, of our operati okay. operating budget um, for facility uh, maintenance. And this, along with our normal operating budget for maintenance and repairs and et cetera, would get us there. And just bring out, yeah. that's that's a state requirement. And I just want to bring out so that the public does not get fooled. Everybody take a look at how the buildings are around the state. And I ask you if that funding is really enough for those school buildings. Thank you. Other questions, comments? All right. Um, so we have a, a motion and a second on the floor to approve the FY22 capital budget with the town adjustments. Um, we'll call the vote. Um, Ms. Kelly? Aye. Uh, Mr. Ferber? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Shears? Nay. Mr. Payero? Yes. Uh, Mr. Vadney? Yes. Uh, Emily Copeland? Yes. 6-1. Uh, um, approval. Okay. I move for discussion on action of the one year extension of the Tom tuition agreement. Second. All right. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. And um, do you want to bring that up, uh, Ms. Viveros? Okay. Um, so uh, at our last meeting, we, um, we rejected uh, the, the draft from the Little Compton attorney. Um, that we had sent, um, uh, there was, it, it appears to be some misunderstandings. Um, since then, we had a meeting uh, between um, the two superintendents, uh, the two chairs, mm -hmm. two um, uh, lawyers for both school committees to see if we could do um, a draft that would then be um, voted up or down uh, by each school committee for this one year extension that Little Compton has asked for. Um, Little Compton uh, voted uh, last week uh, to approve uh, this one year extension. And um, as you can see uh, from um, the, the existing contract, which everybody has in backup, um, you know, this um, uh, in slightly different format includes the language from um, the, uh, or includes the ideas uh, from the uh, original uh, contract extension that uh, our lawyer had drafted up. Um, um, comments, questions, concerns? Mr. Ferber. Um, I'll, be, I'll be voting no to approve this. And the reason is primarily for the second half of the contract. I don't feel that um, 13,500 is an adequate number. That's about 2,000, we have a county um, out of district um, fee that we charge of a, roughly 15,500 and adjusted for inflation. So this is $2,000 per student below that. And if, for round numbers, if we had 100 students, that's $200,000 that we wouldn't be getting. And we're asking our town basically to subsidize that. I just don't agree with that. And further, um, the Little Compton owes us 300,000, roughly $300,000 for the overcharge that Portsmouth absorbed for the special, the special education district when it existed. And we were charged the fee that they should have been charged. And we asked for reimbursement of that and we were rejected. I'm, I'm offended by that. And then additionally, when we established the need for Chromebooks, we went to Little Compton and asked them to uh, pay for their share of the Chromebooks. It, it was a fee that we didn't anticipate. Unfortunately, we had a 10 year contract. Their lawyer said that um, the contract should, inc should in in uh, include the, the price of the Chromebooks. I disagree, but it's, you know, we could argue about it. It wasn't gonna be worth the trouble of arguing about it. But I just feel that, you know, in good faith, the town should have provided the cost of those Chromebooks, which would have been about $36,000 at the time. So I just don't feel I can ask the town to subsidize uh, this contract. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Shears. Yeah, I will be voting no, because uh, past history added to now what we're doing. We've had a contract with Little Compton for the past 10 years. 
at a flat $9,000 a year. Our costs have gone up as uh, my council uh, board member here, Mate, has said, uh, to approximately $15,000, dollars $16,000. So Little Compton has been to the good already, a good five to $6 million. Now we're asking again, uh, as it has been pointed out, that uh, we are up to around $16,000 or so on, per student. We're subsidizing them. And uh, I take great umbrage at the uh, documents that were sent to Little Compton. I've been in business for 40 years and I've never saw, seen a two page contract agreement uh, letter of intent where one of the parties has put a red line through every line in the document. That wasn't a misunderstanding in my opinion. That was unreasonable and disrespectful. And in my opinion, that when that happens, it was rejected, that deal is gone. And uh, you only get one bite of the apple, we've already given that. And I'd like to say our president and other people have said, pay, pay a fair share. We want a fair share. That's what we want from Little Compton is a fair share. And we're not getting that. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. Bradney? No, through, uh, first, I'll say I completely agree with Fred and Alan's position. But um, thinking of the Little Compton students, I think, and this, this is a one-year extension to the contract, and this will give Little Compton School Committee time to make other arrangements because they do need to provide a high school education to the kids. And again, though I agree, I do have reservations, and I think that the agreement's well written, but I have to wonder, you know, if there's going to be a wiggling on that in the next two years. And, but, um, you know, think about the, the kids and the fact that it is you know, going to be covering the next two school years. Um, you know, I'll, with preservation, vote to support. Thank you. Other committee members? So um, I, I'm going to vote to support this. I, um, I, I hear the concerns of the, the Portsmouth School Committee members. I, too, was very upset when... Little Compton voted 7-0 not to pay for the Chromebooks, which were unanticipated costs. And, and I think there has been some free writing, um, but I think, um, you know, Mr. Vadney pointed out, we've, we've welcomed Little Compton students in, at Portsmouth. I think they're, they're a valuable um, asset for the schools. And what I think the best aspect of this agreement is, is that it gives both sides um, certainty for the next two years, it uh, it clearly states the states that at the end of two years, you know that this um, this agreement is over. Um, you know, obviously, Little Compton will be going out to bid, and you know, if there is a new agreement between Portsmouth and Little Compton, then um, hopefully it will be much better written than the <laughs> than the last contract. Um, so uh, again, I, I too, you know, um, Little Compton has clearly been getting quite the bargain these last few years, but um, every district has a four percent cap, and I think it would be very uh, hard for Little Compton to to make that jump. So I view this as a transitional rate. But I I hear and and I sympathize with the comments that are being made, but I will be voting um, in favor of this agreement. Um, are there any other comments, sentiments people want to expend? Okay, I'm going to then um, call the vote. Uh, Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? No. Ms. McDade? Aye. Uh, Mr. Shears? No. Mr. Piera? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Yes. Uh, Emily Copeland? Aye. Uh, the agreement passes 5-2. Um, all right, uh, moving on to business item D. Can uh, I have move, a motion? Yeah, move for discussion and action of the one-year contract extension for NEA Portsmouth. Second. Second. 
Uh, Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. Uh, just asking here for uh, final school committee approval. Uh, we, on this uh, one year extension to the NEA uh, contract, we've discussed this. Um, we would be rolling over the, the current contract with one uh, slight change, which we've already, you know, the committee did already vote to institute for this school year around uh, family sick leave. Uh, other than that, it's a complete rollover with a 1% uh, salary increase, which is represented within uh, the budget, uh, you know, that we've already approved and uh, was talked about again this evening. So uh, the full NEA membership has voted to uh, approve this. So it is before you this evening. And, um, you know, if, if it is, if you vote in favor of it, we will then uh, sign it to ratify it. Questions, comments? All right, um, calling the vote on this. Um, Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Yes. Emily Copeland? Aye. Unanimous 7 0. And I'd yep. uh, like to offer our thanks to NEA for working with us and uh, doing this so that we don't have to negotiate during COVID. So thank you, thank you very much to the NEA. Yep. Just to remind, so both both of our unions, NEA and Council 94, did, did do this at our yep. request. Um, and this helped us uh, certainly a lot in the budget process. I move, excuse me, I move for discussion and action of the Hathaway Outdoor Classroom. Second. All right, Steve, we're going to uh, unmute uh, Mrs. Little. Uh, so just a few meetings ago, Mrs. Little had come before us to talk about, uh, you know, oh, some great work that's been happening at Hathaway. Uh, we know, um, you know what Melville had been able to do in the last few years around, um, you know, just a fantastic outdoor uh, learning uh, classroom that was created there. So Hathaway is looking to do much the same thing. They came forward with some ideas that Mrs. Little shared. Uh, I think the committee did ask her to go back and get some final information. Uh, so, the, you know, again, they've, they've done a lot of hard work in between. Uh, she wants to bring that forward to you this evening uh, and just get you um, to uh, hope, you know, hopefully vote to approve uh, to solidify this. All right. Thanks, Dr. Kenworthy. Um, so I just, it's been a long and winding road these past um, couple of years trying to get this classroom built, but I think we're ready. Um, I do want to thank Chris Dioro and Jim Dean and um, Rachel Marciano for their support in, in um, this process, especially over this past year and this COVID year. I know it's been difficult. Um, so we had come, when I came to you last time, we were about ready to go out to bid for a wooden structure. Um, the committee that we had, the vision committee at Hathaway really wanted something that was permanent, a permanent structure. So we had come to you, we were going out to bid for that. Very interesting process. Um, and I got to attend the on-site meeting where the, the companies came and asked their questions and, um, you know, um, looked at what we were thinking of. And then I attended the Zoom meeting as well where the envelopes were open and the bids ranged all the way from, I think it was with the add-ons, I think it was close to $97,000 all the way to, I don't know, maybe 160 or 70. I, I was just, I'm like, what is that company doing? But anyway, um, so there was quite a range. So when we were looking at our funding, um, that was a lot of money. You know, we had about $50,000. And if we wanted the add-ons and we had, a, this is where Chris was very, very helpful with, um, for me and, you know, to talk it through with me. Um, I went back to the committee a couple times and we started to go a different route. So we had worked with Creative Recreation a little while back um, on our playground. We got some playground equipment from them. And also the outdoor classroom at Melville was from Creative Recreation. It was not one of the companies that bid. It was something in a very different avenue for us. So I reached out to the um, owner of the company and that's where all the conversation started. And that we, this structure here looks very similar to Melville's, but it is a permanent structure, um, not one where the roof comes down. Ours would be 30 by 30. That's a little larger, I believe. Um, so we are looking, we, we actually took a little visit over to Melville um, one day to, I took my, my people from the committee and we checked out the flooring, which everybody loved. And so we went this route and we got an estimate for something like this for the outdoor classroom, which is what we are hoping you will approve that we can um, go forward with. So this is a picture of it. And then the estimate for 
the amount of work um, is much more in our ballpark coming in at $54,553. So we are um, able to, we, we were able to fund that entirely. So we're here to ask for permission to build the classroom. Our hope is that um, with approval, we can go forward and I'm looking at Chris and perhaps get this built by um, the start of the school year. Wow. Yeah, I would just add that this, uh, this quote is under um, a pre-bid uh, source well contract. We're a member, it's a purchasing consortium. So um, we would obviously reject all the bids from um, the RFP we put out and we'd go with this pre-bid contract. Questions, Mr. Ferber and then Mr. Payero. Is it hurricane proof? <laughs> Doubtful. It's more so hurricane proof than the one over at Melville, I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's permanent. It's a permanent structure. Are those fighting words? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, they're not. But I'm just, you know, if that one was approved, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I did my homework on this one. So. Obviously, you're ready for it. <laughs> oh, no, this is really going to turn into a fight. Uh, so uh, the only question I have is when it comes to our original review of the plans, Yeah. Uh, we were talking about location. I just wanted to know if those plans were... Uh, redone and rendered. Yeah, we moved the location to where you you wanted it. Absolutely. Right, perfect. Yes. Yeah. So where it's behind the cemetery, a little bit to the right. It's yeah. Yeah. And again, did I, I heard you correctly saying that you have raised all the money to cover this? We have, and a, a great big shout out to our HPTA because they gave us the original thirty thousand dollars. We did get. Um, you know, we won the box top contest, which was huge. That was 20,000. And that check came in the mail last week. So we're super excited about that. And the HPTA is willing to um, give us the money for the rest of it. So, yeah. Great. Great. Mr. Shear. Did you happen to look at what a cupola would cost on it? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will also add that there, there is not an area for lounge chairs and toasting and roasting marshmallows, but at least it's something. <laughs> Keep raising money. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we will. <laughs> move away from this. <laughs> yeah, I think it's time to take a vote. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Great. hearing no further questions, calling the vote, Ms. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ferber. Aye. Ms. McDade. Aye. Mr. Shear. Aye. Mr. Payero. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Yes. Uh, or an aye. Emily Copeland. Aye. Uh, unanimous 7-0. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, can I have a motion for item F, please? I move for discussion and action on the budget transfer on budget transfer greater than five thousand. Second, Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. I wanted to uh, bring this before you. So, for a couple of reasons, um, so budget transfer is over five thousand dollars. We would, um, by by policy, be doing that. Um, so, this one is for a total of fifty one hundred dollars. Um, so, meets that threshold. But uh, this will uh, be the down payment for us to begin to engage. Uh, working with the Equity Institute. So uh, they are a local organization. They come highly recommended by, by many local school districts who work with them. Uh, so as we move forward into next school year, uh, they will be uh, providing services for us that they basically call an e equity audit. Um, myself, Dr. Viveros and Mr. Pyrus did meet with representatives from the organization. Um, they would you know, they propose they'll be working with us uh, at the start of next school school year for three three months of solid work around focus groups and surveys and looking at district policies and uh, you know interviewing people and then uh, provide us with some recommendations. So overall, it's about six months of total work. We'll then get findings, which you know we can then bring forward to our you know this certainly the school committee and our uh, racial equity uh, subcommittee and help us uh, you know, kind of uh, further decide where we wanna move uh, with the work we've been doing in this area. Uh, so we uh, will anticipate we will be able to pay the remainder of uh, this contract with the Equity Institute through um, uh, the title grants. Um, you know, we, we have a, a couple that we know this, this type of work would, would definitely fit, fit within. 
great. That's great. Um, Mr. Shears. Okay, so the five thousand dollar down. Uh, what do you anticipate the cost? To be then. Sure. So you have the, the full contract there is in the back of Mr. Shears. So uh, for this in, in the entire work we'll be doing with the Equity Institute, uh, it's, uh, I believe seventeen thousand dollars total. So this uh, fifty one hundred. Um, when, once uh, we're able to to kind of make that payment, I will then be able to kind of. Right now we've had preliminary discussions. I'll be able to to start meeting with the organization and set some some concrete steps in place for next year. But the uh, the total cost is $17,000. So, and we anticipate we'll be able to write the uh, remaining 12,000 into uh, some of our federal grants. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. And um, uh, this is also fitting in not only with the racial equity work or the equity work, but also with the strategic plan. They're gonna link into that as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. No other comments? All right, calling the vote. Uh, Ms. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Ferber. Aye. Ms. McDade. Aye. Mr. Shears. Aye. Mr. Payero. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Yes. Uh, Emily Copeland. Aye. Seven zero. You're doing that to mess with yeah. <laughs> 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 Move for discussion and action on the approval of con contract renewal for the Portsmouth High School Director of Student Services. Second. Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you. So uh, last meeting, I started to bring some individual contracts forward. Um, you know, typically, again, we have uh, our two main bargaining units, Council 94 and NEA. Um, and we do have a number of, of part-time employees also, but anybody, um, most of our full-time employees who, who are not um, a member of, of one of our bargaining units uh, work on individual contracts. Uh, so um, we have a number of individuals whose contracts were coming um, uh, expiring at the end of the school year. I started to bring some forward last meeting. And so this meeting, I'm asking for approval, uh, renewal of uh, a couple in particular. So uh, item G pertains to the director of student services at Portsmouth High School, who is Chad Smith, a longtime district employee, has been serving in the role. Uh, this would be a contract renewal uh, for him again at the 1% uh, salary increase that all district employees are budgeted for. Mm -hmm. And these, these next three items were reviewed in the, in the uh, personnel subcommittee. Comments, questions? No? All right, calling the vote. Uh, Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Badney? Yes. Emily Copeland? Aye. 7-0 uh, uh, renewed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We'll move for discussion and action of the approval of the contract renewal for the Portsmouth High School Director of Freshman Academy slash Student Services. Second. All right. Thank you. So same thing here. This is a contract renewal. Uh, somebody currently serving in the position. Uh, this is Colin Grimsey. Uh, so we uh, brought on uh, Freshman Academy. Um, I guess it would have been three years ago now. Colin is finishing up his, his first contract with us. Um, again, he's been doing an admirable job there. Uh, this would be just a renewal of his contract rolled over with the 1% salary increase. Questions, comments? All right, calling the vote. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Yes. Emily Copeland? Aye. Uh, unanimous 7-0. I move for discussion and action on the approval of the contract for the Director of College and Career Readiness. Second. Dr. Kennedy. Thank you. Uh, so you, we had uh, talked about this uh, position throughout the budget process. This, is, this was our one kind of new position, but in, in creating it, we did combine some existing positions so that there was no uh, you know, FTE uh, or employee increase, if you will, in, in the district. Uh, but this is an important position and we feel uh, we need connects well to uh, goals and objectives in our strategic plan. Uh, so you did approve a job description uh, for this position. We uh, advertised and were pleased uh, to see uh, that we had a uh, highly qualified candidate in the district who was interested in this position. So uh, I am recommending uh, Paige kerwin Clare uh, to be uh, the you know, Director of College and Careerness and Phyllis position. And this evening, I am asking you to approve uh, this contract for her. All right, questions, comments? 
Okay. Um, calling the vote, Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Yes. Emily Copeland? Aye. Uh, approved 6 1. All right. Uh, I think our next items are policy. Ms. McDade, do you want to? Sure. Um, I move for a discussion and action on the Family Medical Leave Act policy, which is DCCAC. Second. Let him do it. Too. Okay, well, let him do it. Too. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. Um, any changes? Um, this is a policy that was uh, read in committee. And I believe it's the first time we're seeing it as a whole. As we're seeing it, that's right. We're seeing it as first time here. Right. Um, so let's pull that policy up if we can. Um, either I can do it or you want to do it? I did want to point out, uh, we do have uh, Mrs. Kim McGuire is on our Director of Human Resources. So this is, you know, as Kim has been working, she has flagged some policies that were, were definitely in need of updating for us. This, this was one of those. Um, so if you J, getting it, have questions. HIJ, Business Family Medical, got it. Okay, I can share screen. Oh, I got it. Uh, um, screen. Okay. Uh, Sorry, there we go. <clears throat> so um, somebody wants to walk us through this or? Yeah, uh, uh, Kim, Kim, did you wanna walk us through? Apparently I can do that. Um, so this policy is replacing um, the old policy 41113, which was uh, adopted in 2008. Uh, there were some, certainly some updates needed. And what this does is it really just outlines all of the um, the general benefits, eligibility, and um, and qualifying reasons for FMLA and the Rhode Island uh, Paid Family Medical Leave Act. Um, they're very similar, but they do have some differences that are spelled out here in the policy. Um, one of the things that, that changed in this policy as opposed to the old one is um, in the, actually it's in the introduction that we use a 12 month counting uh, method uh, which is a rolling 12 months to define uh, how we define the leave taken under the policy. So the old policy had it listed as a calendar year. Um, that is not what we, that's not the preferred method. It's not what we've actually been uh, practicing uh, and we are going to the rolling. So I wanted to point out that that was a change um, from the old policy. Um, and Additionally, the rest of it really is just taken from both uh, the Family Medical Leave Act and the Rhode Island Paid Family Medical Leave Act. Uh, and then there's another area where, where employers have discretion as far as the use of sick time running concurrently with, with the leave uh, because FMLA and the Rhode Island FMLA is unpaid leave. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do require the use of sick time to run concurrently. And that is under the, um, on page two, paid leave benefit coordination with family, uh, with FMLA and Rhode Island paid FMLA. Uh, so I did uh, add the links also to the acts themselves and uh, just added the legal references. All right. And the policy subcommittee voted, move it all forward, read it. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? I don't believe we vote on this. Yeah, okay, no, it's a second read, so. Okay, yeah. thank you. And if anybody in the audience has comments, uh, you, you have another read to, um, you have another chance to comment as well. Um, all right, uh, can I have a motion? Thank you. Make, thank you. Uh, for uh, Kate, please. Okay, I move for discussion of the educational philosophy and school district mission policy, AD. Second. Got that one. Okay. And uh, Dr. Viveris, I believe you were the lead on this one. Yep. Oh, well, already. So I apologize. I my computer is due for an update. It's not opening documents as easily. Um, okay. Yes. So we, there were actually very minimal changes to this policy. We had a pretty strong policy in place. What we did do is we looked at our strategic plan and we um, pulled over the core beliefs, the, those five core beliefs that we had highlighted in our strategic plan. That was the really the only change in this policy. So what's, I'm just curious. I mean, I have no problem with the policy. What's the purpose of this one? I mean, I can see where all the other ones set out like 
guidelines to act, et cetera. But what, why, why do we have this policy? So uh, that's actually a really good question. So when I started looking at reviewing um, the policies that we have, this one was under um, uh, instruction. So it was one that when I pulled and I reviewed, it was almost as though we're just we're restating our philosophy and our mission. Um, this is one I believe that we should be actually updating a lot more often because as we work on our strategic plan and we make the changes there, then that should be pulled into our philosophy and our mission. Okay, I believe it's just a typical, I mean, yeah. you know, it's a recommended policy. Obviously, it's got the, uh, the National School Board um, designation there. Uh, I would think that another intention of it is just if, you know, strategic plans are usually written for three to five years. So for whatever reason, a strategic plan expired you would have this policy to refer back to. And just to add, um, policies that are in Section A are all foundational policies that are geared towards the philosophy of the district. And so they become touchstones for other policies that we're saying these are, you know, this is what we value, this is what we believe in, and then other policies spring from that. They refer back to this as well. It's just kind of all wraps it around. Okay, just curious. So we don't need a vote on this one either. Correct. Okay, um, moving on to L. I move for discussion of the annual budget policy, which is DB. Second. And Mr. Euro can uh, answer any questions on this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so this, this was a policy that had not been updated in a while. Uh, and so my goal here was to, um, having gone through uh, now nine budget cycles uh, in the district, to update this uh, with modern language and better reflect uh, the actual process that we go through, uh, and also uh, insert language uh, around principal empowerment, which hadn't been in there uh, and was a change in the law. Yeah, I noticed that this one uh, referenced the um, school improvement team as part of the process. Yes, yeah, we added that. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Not a, not a comment, but when it comes to the legal references, um, I'd say being on this side, I know, yeah, I know what 16211 is, um, but can we, if it's general law, can we just put GL in front of it? For, for all of them, sure. Yeah, just so that people know what, what we're referencing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Other, thank you, good comment. Other questions, comment? No? All right, this is also a second read, so we don't need a vote. All right, can we have a motion for M, please? I move for uh, discussion and action of the removal of policy 5128, which is replaced by policy IKS. Second. And for this one, uh, this was uh, Dr. Colwell's suggestion. So we had a very inclusive policy subcommittee meeting uh, yeah. last, last month. So uh, <laughs> Dr. Colwell can walk us through what, what, what her recommendation on this is. Sure. So you may remember when we had revised our graduation policy um, previously, uh, there was a provision, Dr. Uh, Viveros or Kenworthy, if you could scroll down, there was a provision in there about ident of, of talking about students with disabilities. I think one of the things that we should have done is cross-referenced it with current policy, which is the 5-1, if you could keep scrolling, the one that follows it, 5128, which really is, is not commensurate with A, what current law tells us, number one, Number two, if, but just by looking at it, you certainly can see some outdated language, such as the use of the word handicapped. Um, but students with disabilities don't generally have a different set of graduation requirements if they are on a regular high school diploma tract. Um, our new policy, if you scroll up again, also does make provisions for students who are an alternate assessment. So the, the short story is that the 5128 should have been eliminated when we revised this policy. Yeah, I noticed it also refers to members of the district, which we are special ed district, which we are no longer. So correct. Um, that's, that's another reason to get rid of it. <laughs> no. Indeed. Yeah. And for this one, you, you can take actions even because we're just asking to yeah, we retire it. Uh, approve the retirement or removal. Other comments, questions? Seeing none, calling the vote, Ms. Kelly. Hi. Mr. Ferber. Hi. 
Ms. McDade? Aye. Mr. Ferrer Shears? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Badney? Yes. Emily Copeland? Yes. Unanimous 7 0. Okay. That Thank you. Has been retired. Thank you, one and all. Um, so, um, uh, Dr. Kenworthy and I were were saying, you know, there is an awful lot. Can we pull the legislation up? Yeah, There's... I'm gonna I'm gonna share this version because yeah. I took out um, the comments that were in the uh, that you have in your in the backup, so we can just refer to the uh, pieces of legislation here. Yeah. Oh, actually, we need a motion for discussion, please. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, so um, there's an all. So from Rias, we get these lists of bills that are coming forward. Um, you know, a, a, a lot of them dealing with education and pretty some pretty far ranging things. And then um, Dr. Kenworthy was saying that's also come up in the superintendents uh, association. And there are a couple that are pretty concerning, I think, for us, if we... Uh, I believe it's the ones at the end, right, if we scrolled. Uh, yeah, so the the thought would be, um, is this something we would want to, at a minimum, uh, you know, send an email to our state, um, you know, reps and sort of say the school committee does not support, uh, we could do a formal resolution to go along with that. But I think what we don't want to be is asleep at the wheel um, and, and all of a sudden have some of these passed, which may be not in our interest, or maybe they are, right? Um, so maybe um, everybody's had a chance to look at this. And the, the ones that were flagged as maybe having a concern, and, and I'm not seeing here the no's. Which one? Is this the first one? It, it's the ones that I started predicting. The last four, I believe, are the ones that... Uh, so are we, Liz, is this the last four? It, yeah, think, I'm sharing it from up, my sanitized oh, version. Up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you're, so yes. these are the last four. Yes. Okay. I mean, so, you have more details in the backup, um, but it's particularly, again, unless somebody wanted to go back to another one. Right. No, this um, is good. This yeah, is good. I think yeah. it's the last four that. Well, this is up a five, two, three, seven. That's with the uh, hold harmless method of calculating education aid. Well, let's oh, let's let's look at these bottom four, and then we can go to the other, right? Um, so, I mean, because I think in some ways, if they pass and we don't send a message supporting them, it's less problematic than if something passes and yeah. we're concerned about it, right? So, uh, do you want to talk about this this bill, Tom, or do you want to? Yeah. Sure, no, I can, and I, I think Dr. Colwell here can can provide some insight as well. So, this one um, this one is 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 opposed by. Uh, Superintendents, uh, school committee, and the uh, special ed director association. Uh, it's just seen as uh, a, you know a step that uh, you know the, the the key organizations feel is unnecessary related to special education. We have enough provisions and safeguards in place. Uh, I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Dr. Colwell. Well, there's a lot I'd love to add, but. Um... <laughs> But um, I think some of the key tenets of it is they are actually in con conflict with current law, which creates a whole host of unintended consequences. I do believe it comes from a place of wanting to improve the system. But the federal government, when they created the IDEA, established procedures for when there is disagreement among families and teams. And this ombudsperson adds an additional layer to that and creates a number of conflicts. It creates a number of conflicts regarding when, um, when matters may go to a mediation. It creates confidentiality conflicts. It um, also, in some cases, requires districts to answer to the ombudsman. Um, and, and really the list goes on. But um, I agree with Dr. Kenworthy, my professional organization has taken a very strong um, opinion on this and we have um, we also understand and are aware that there are other professional organizations and other individuals who are not in favor of this legislation um questions yeah um so all right so maybe we we could kind of go through the the four and then others and sort of see where where we're at with this. So the the so the bill is Senate Bill four five four, and the by is the second bill or what's this? No, it's the representatives or senators who have uh, sponsored. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the next one. By oh, Boston sorry. Archibald. Yeah, so 
I, I, I didn't see, and I checked on both the school committee and superintendent's version. I didn't see a bill number. I don't know if that means that it means, hasn't been. It means it's been it's been sent. Legal counsel hasn't even assigned it a number yet. So it hasn't actually been having. Hasn't, yeah, it just hasn't been assigned a number. According to the information we received, it's there, there is concern that this could move forward. And I think if you read, you know, what it would be proposing, you know, we we you know, dealt with this situation last year. Uh, if schools were to to again close for, you know, a, a month a particular or whatever reason, in January, yeah, yeah, um, you know, we were able to negotiate, um, you know, a, a certain monetary figure with our with our bus company. This one would, you know, kind of lock us in paying for services that yeah. we wouldn't be using. I don't know, Mr. DRO, is that, does this come up at all in discussion with the uh, Finance Directors Association? Me and uh, You're that. muted, Chris. I can see him talking. Oh. Should we point out that right. age is spelled? Um, uh, uh, Tom, what I was saying, I'm sorry, I was uh, muted, but uh, no, this is, um, when I saw this in the backup uh, a few days ago, this was the first time I had seen this. Yeah, so supposedly there's a lot of discussion and, um, you know, while it hasn't officially moved forward yet, if, if it were to do so, it would be concerning. Okay. Um, let's go down. Any comments? Yeah, age should be A-I-D-E-S. Okay. Don't revise that. <laughs> All right. Uh, House Bill 5197. Sure. Uh, this is one. Um, again, we don't. We we have great uh, school nurse teachers in the district. Uh, we are are happy with the services they're able to provide. But uh, this would reverse uh, last year. Uh, we we did. Uh, you know, af after much uh, you know suggestion and lobbying from uh, key organizations, we did get a uh, legislation passed which allows a district, while uh, you know everybody can see the benefit of hiring a, a certified school nurse teacher. Uh, in some cases, if we weren't able to do so, or uh, we, we didn't need any, if we, you know, if we could just, we didn't need any sort of teaching. There is uh, current legislation that allows districts to employ RNs uh, in, in the role of, of school nurses. Uh, so this bill uh, would basically you know, reverse that action and go back to insisting that we could only hire certified uh, school nurse teachers. Is that for even for like subs? Uh, I, yeah, we probably get some leeway when it comes to subs. Uh, Dr. Cole, do you have any other information with this for this one? Yeah, it, I mean, the substitute issue, regardless of this legislation or not, has always um has always needed some flexibilities when we're looking at substitutes. So I would imagine to Dr. Camarothi's point that that would continue um, being allowed. I don't recall seeing anything in there about substitutes other than just those who are em employed, you know, on full contract and whatnot. Yeah, it's just something that's seen as it would be taking a step backwards from, mm -hmm. you know, a key development we were able to get into place within the last few years. I know it's helped us tremendously during during the pandemic. Nobody obviously foresaw that, but you know, it, it is opposed uh, organizationally by the, the superintendent and school committee associations. But at the elementary school, just a point of clarification, don't we have certified school nurse teachers? I mean, right now we have all of all our of schools them. right happen yeah. to be, but you know, we, well, at the elementary, yeah, there's probably you know, more teaching that may happen. You know, we do have the flexibility now that if for whatever reason, let's say at the middle or high school, right, we decided, you know, we, we say we tried to find a certified school nurse or just decided that, you know, we, we could fill the role with, with uh, you know, an RN, a registered nurse. We, there is legislation that allows us the flexibility to do that. So this could be seeking to reverse that legislation, kind of go back to the way uh, things, you know, had been for many years. How do you become a certified nurse teacher? Is, do they require um, education courses? Yeah. Additional education courses. So it's, not just yeah. it's, a, it's a master's program. Okay. It's a master's program, a BSN or a bachelor's of, um, a bachelor's of science in nursing is not um, adequate to be a school nurse teacher. It is a master's program, so it does require an advanced degree. So I would imagine they're pretty hard to find. There historically has been a shortage through the years of them. 
Um, and a lot of it has to do, I think, with, um, you know, just the willingness of nurses to go on for their for their master's degree because it is an advanced degree where they can, you know, work in a hospital, you know, setting, you know, with their bachelor's degree once they're licensed would be my my guess in terms of of the shortage. Um, but um, yeah, it does. There is, a, like I said, a requirement for an advanced degree. So I do think that that might be a, a potential contributing, you know, factor because they do have to student teach. They have to do certain practicums in community community uh, health, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They even have to learn a little bit about special education and kids with disabilities. So it's a it's a pretty rigorous program that they go through. Um, I'm just I'm I called up the legislation and I'm just looking at it. It's less than a page long. It's as it's worded currently, and it's it, there are no exceptions or explanations. It just says. Um, each school system shall employ certified nurse teacher personnel certified by the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, the only exception is that says this section shall not apply to those school districts which are currently allowed to share certified nurse teacher personnel by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Huh. So, and that's the whole bill. Yeah, no, it doesn't sound like a lot yeah. of exceptions. It would, again, just be taking a step backwards from a you know, key change we're able to get in place. It it's just allows needed flexibility that districts can realize. Okay. I mean, I, I personally, I, I think, you know, in the elementary schools, they actually do teach. I don't yeah. think they teach in the, in the high school, right? Because isn't health and all that. Yeah. Or I, so that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Okay. Uh, so lastly, this one, um, again, if you read it, would, would be concerning here. Um, and my understanding is this is being driven primarily, um, you know, by the representatives who sponsored it. And I think the uh, League of Cities and Towns, uh, you know, we all know, uh, you know, and we will be providing much more information in the coming months. Uh, school districts are, are going to be getting additional uh, CARES Act funding. Um, so this this bill would would seek to allow municipalities uh, to uh, reduce the uh, school budgets, you know, based on that funding. Um, uh, obviously, we, we would not support that uh, as we have you know some some pretty specific uh, needs uh, that we need to use that money to address. Uh, and uh, the other main reason is that you know municipalities themselves are getting their own share of. Uh, you know, COVID CARES Act uh, money. So this uh, this bill doesn't even make mention of that. Yeah, I could just see that creating tons of problems in the future, you know, like in the future too, if you sort of Precedent dip setting. down and dip up and yeah, yeah. So those, again, those are the four ones that were, I think the most concerning, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. you Madden, have others you have there. Uh, yes, there was up front. Uh, up at the top. Kim mentioned it. Yeah, it is first. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's talking. Oh, hold harmless method as the employee to governors. You know, for the um, or um, hold harmless. Yeah, it's five two three seven. It's a hold harmless um, five, method. Five two three. That's towards the front. Yeah, second seven. one. Yeah, second one. Oh, here we go. No, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah, thought this would be to our disadvantage with state aid. Yeah, I think what that was um, that was basically saying because all so many or not so many our district not as much but in some districts there were very significant numbers of homeschooled. Mm -hmm. So if they calculate state state aid based on the homeschool, you know, like taking away that population for the next year, that would really. Um, if I under if that's the one I think it was, it was like trying not to. Yeah, but this one, but we didn't. Have been like we got a few what new uh, homeschool classes. No, no, I'm saying yeah. what they were doing is they, they calculate yeah. state aid yeah. actually based on yeah. some I mean, older data, right. and if they look at this year's data, it's going to hurt a lot of districts because yeah. it's going to look like they have fewer students. Yeah. This this came up in the discussion of the funding formula as well because funding formula amounts are based largely on numbers of free and reduced lunch kids, and because Lunches have been free. Provided yeah. all year, there are a lot of people, you know, parents who just didn't do the paperwork because they, you know, they didn't they need to. Right. And so, um, 
there was discussion about the fact that this that was going to make you know this year's numbers are an aberration right in okay. a lot of ways i i didn't attend that i'd like to ask a question did anybody mention if they thought that the funding formula was working or not um Sure, there are, sure, there are many districts who are looking for them. Municipality, you are not working very well for us, but actually, um, one of the things that I came away with a better understanding of is that the idea of the funding formula is to get um, the idea of the funding formula is to get districts to a minimal funding yeah. level, and so you know, um. <laughs> What we're talking about in districts that benefited more from state aid is that these are environments in which, based on the property values in the, in the district, based on the number of kids who are on free and reduced lunch, based on some other factors as well, that district is more in need of state funds to bring it to a minimal level. Um, so it's the, the, the understanding was not that, you know, oh, with this money, these districts are going to leapfrog the other districts and zoom ahead. It was really getting it up to, you know, a, a baseline. Um, and then you add to that the fact that when the funding formula was created, it was the, the overall amount being funded was not increased. So it's a, it's a reallocation, but it's not a change in, you know, the amount that's going out. I mean, things have been adjusted, the, the amounts have been adjusted over the years you know, to reflect. And, and, and I think that. too, part of the idea was so that, you know, there would be sort of a more continuity of expectations, what people would be getting. Because prior to the funding formula, I think it went up and down and, you know, um, so, I mean, I, this is a case where I think the intentions are good, the devil's in the details, you know. Sure. When, when they talked about the history of it, uh, the first funding formula was created in 1960. And um, between 1960 and 1995, there were little changes here and there. And then in 1960, uh, 1995, um, around the time of the banking crisis, people <laughs> generally people, the decision was made that, you know, we didn't have to pay attention to the funding formula at all. And they were kind of making it up on the fly yeah. from 1995 until uh, 2010 when this formula was adopted. And I think when they adopted it, Rhode Island was one of only a handful of states that didn't have a funding formula. Yeah. All other states. I mean, I don't know which ones, but I think it was, we were really an outlier in that. But. Karen made a key point. The biggest problem we have in the state is the pool's not growing. Right. I mean, you know, the, the state's economy has been stagnant for years. Um, I had a question or a comment really about the last bill that we were discussing uh, about the um, uh, 6287. So we're, I think we'd be opposed to it, but how would you wordsmith the opposition to it? You know, it's just um, sort of like, you know, they're saying the schools don't deserve any more support because they're getting COVID relief. We're opposed to it for the reasons we know. Right. How could you express? I would say because one, this COVID relief is one-time money. It's tied to very specific um, addressing educational loss. It's not just Oh, cut our budget by 5% and we can use this to pay regular salaries. It's supposed to be supplemental, not substitute. Right, yeah. and so if they do this, they're really just cutting budgets. Right. And as, as um, Bill pointed out, it's for um, catch up. Basically. And acceleration. Yeah. Yeah. And, there, and uh, I think in some wording that I saw, I don't know if it's in the backup um, details, but um, you know, in some people's minds who have a bad taste in their mouth, if you will, this is carried over from, um, uh, you know, the last major relief bill during the Obama administration. But at that, at that time, uh, cities and towns did not receive their own allocation, whereas, you know, with the uh, COVID relief money, there'll be a separate allocation going to cities and towns. I think the town administrator mentioned that it's a couple of million at least yeah, it's, coming to yeah. Portsmouth, so... For the school, for the school department. No, for no, the no, no. For the town, the town's allocation the town. has. That, has... That's the big difference this time is that cities and towns are going to get their own money separate from what school okay. districts are getting. That, that doesn't sound right because there's five. I know the town's getting five million for um, to be used 
for sewerage, which that won't be the case with us. Broadband, which also yeah, no, it's some it, of those things. I think it's five yeah. million. Then it is five million. I know yeah. it. Is. Um, so it was more than two. I knew it was seven. Yeah, million. because because that five million, uh, there's four categories: sewerage, broadband, water, and I forget the other. So so two million of it, according to Rainer, has already been predestined for uh, Prudence Island. So the other three million presumably would go to the water district. So, um, and I did just want to point out, um, Dr. Copeland, where we're talking about all these bills. I mean, this was a, a, yeah. a lot of efforts on the part of, uh, you know, we have many Portsmouth local, students. Yeah, uh, uh, local, local students. Sponsored by this Senator is obviously Sebeny. when we would support, yeah. Um, so do, what's the pleasure of the committee? Do we want to, um, do we want to look into doing a, if we're going to do a formal resolution, we really have, it's, you know, we really have next meeting to do that. If we want to um, resolve that the, the ones that we've talked about that should not be supported, that we should, I, we could draft an email and I can send it out to our kind of a little bit more informally to our state legislators, just to make sure that they're aware that we're aware that these are not ones that we would support. Um, what yeah. is the pleasure of the committee? So, so in the interim between the, today and the next meeting, we should draft responses to those that we're opposed to. Maybe, maybe before the next meeting, I don't know who's going to draft them. Maybe Tom or Liz or both of you or something. Um, <laughs> send it to us for review, so that we can pencil in comments or whatever and discuss that. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, if we just want to keep it simple, we could just say that. Oh. You know, we were made aware of these bills and, and we oppose these four bills because I don't know when they're going to come up for a vote, right? I think that's our problem here. But if I'm, if I'm one of the legislators reading that Portsmouth is opposed to it, my obvious question is why? Well, why then I, then hopefully they would reach out and, and ask, right? I, think, I, I guess my, my concern was we can either do it as individuals, but what I don't want to have happen is what happened when they did that whole sprinkler act after the, the nightclub fire that required massive sprinkler investments in some of the elementary schools, which have never had fires and deaths. And, you know, and, and I'm just saying, I, I don't think we want to be caught sleeping on this. It's possible that like so many other resolutions that we get one or more other school districts are going to draft opposition and circulate it. And we could That's just... why we, I we Tom and I were sort of saying, I have not seen on these specific bills, any forwarded resolutions yet. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be some, but I'm a little worried by the time they they get through yeah. all of these yeah. votes, we're, we're going to be a day late in adoption. Well, what we could do is, rather than doing a resolution to me, which comes across as rather unnecessary, Probably. boring, erratic and all that, Chain and mail. people that are boring, <laughs> is send a formal letter that has each vote we oppose and a paragraph Y. You know, we have the, the number and what we see here, the description of it. And then this is why we're opposed. A formal letter, which we glued on, sent up to Ryan's best from the state. And in the meantime, you can write an informal email saying that we are formatting a formal letter of you know, over these bills we're concerned which about. We just want and these are the aware. bills we want you to know in advance, but it is coming. You're going to be sending it out to Ryan's. That might be a, you that's know, a great, forward. maybe so we draft a, yeah. a letter for approval at the next meeting, but in the meantime, we flag Informal these letter. and say yeah. informally, you know, we send it out to the, the five Portsmouth yeah. um, reps. Does that have everybody yeah. um, get a sense of the committee there? And so why don't then I draft that email and circulate it and people can comment just to make sure, like Fred was saying, it's nobody's saying, hey, I want to disassociate myself from this and we can send that out in form. But if we, I'm just thinking of the open meeting violations. If we, yeah, I think it's better that we just have Emily send it out, just saying, this is what it looks like we're going to approve. It will be formally approved at the next school committee, but we might give you a heads up just in case. The vote comes, comes up yes. for. Yeah. I, was, I was going to say reply to all, but I think that's an open meetings violation. Yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. I, uh, I think you just send formal letters saying this is coming. We want and we'll do a formal then um, formal thing that we can yeah. ratify at the, at the yep. next meeting. And, okay. and then we'll move on. All right. Okay. Is that everybody okay with that? Yep. All right. Um, 
Do I need a vote on that? I guess we'll we'll make we'll do the formal vote next time. All right. So before we adjourn, just like to note that we have an upcoming meeting May twenty fifth, and then June eighth. Is that our meeting or the budget meeting? That is our meeting. Our budget meeting will be the end of June. I thought it was June 9th. The budget meeting? The like town the budget, town budget meeting? Town. It's June town. 28th or something. It's like the very last, one of the very last Mondays. Is it? Yeah, yeah. it's typically the end of the month. No, I'm, I'm talking about the town meeting. Right. The town, I think the town the financial meeting. It's usually it's pretty early around. Okay, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll double so check I on that. So I think there's a, okay. But the next, our next meeting is May 25th. Um, and um, with that, can I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, do you say yes? A unanimous 7-0. <laughs> 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 <laughs>